with a name like Caramel, I'm going to have a hard time not craving candy on this one. If you read the title and paid attention about 15 seconds ago, then you know that today we're going to be taking a look at a rather sweet ink provided for review by Penn Chalet. Okay, so maybe that last part wasn't in the title or the cold open, but a thank you is still in order to the fine folks over at Penn Chalet for this bottle of ink. So diving into the ink, I picked this up in cartridge form along with the rest of the line so we could take a look at that. However, I think it's better that we are looking at it in bottle form because that's how most of you are going to encounter it out in the wild. Also, these are really like aesthetically pleasing and really organizable. Like you can stack them and it, it just works out really well. Anyways, my only real gripe here is the sticker. You know, with this ink, if you take a 50-50 mix of the cardboard here and the sticker, then you have what I think is a pretty good idea of the color. Aside from that though, I like the packaging going on here, and for just under $12, it's actually a really good value for 50 ml of ink. But this color, is it one that I'm going to add to my collection? Well, let's find out. Looking at the ink blot, I'm a little conflicted. I'm not seeing as much caramel as I am tan, peanut, or tortilla. For me to get that caramel vibe, the lighter mids on the right hand side would have to be a little bit more saturated with a reddish undertone. I mean, at least to match the caramel chews that I get when I order music equipment from Sweetwater. That aside, if we look at this ink from the perspective of brown only, I like the different looks that we get. On the right, you have those lighter tans that I was talking about with a touch of chestnut. When we go over to the mids, we start with a nice coppered sepia and fade into a little bit of a cedar meets peanut vibe. I still don't know what to make of the transition tones, and to be honest, I can't quite say if I like what's going on. Let me know what you think about these transition tones in the comments. As we move on over to dry times, this ink is keeping with the Kaveco tradition, so that could be a good or a bad thing. On Rhodia, we're dry by the 10 second mark, and the story is exactly the same over on Tomoe. So this ink is either really consistent or it's super dry. Either way from a broad nib, that's kind of concerning. Before we see how this translates over to writing though, let's take a look at that water sample. Remember when I used to just place the paper in the sink and then try to scrub the ink off with soap and water? Part of me wants to bring that back, but side tangents, well, aside, this isn't a good look for the ink. It's pretty safe to say that this is not going to be classified as water resistant in any stretch of the imagination. And once we get the water off the page, that inference is confirmed. The parts of the ink that water hit are completely gone at this point, much like the inks from the old sink tests. The big difference here is that the paper actually survived the endeavor. So let's see how the ink looks on paper. This time around, we're breaking out the broad nib and starting over on Rhodia. Here are some of my observations as I've written with the ink over the last week and as we do the writing sample now. For how quick the ink dried, I find it to be very well behaved and impressively consistent. The broad nib does a pretty good job keeping close to its standard line width, and I really like that we're getting a mesh of the lighter mids with those transition tones. This performance actually gets it closer to the caramel color that it claims to be on the bottle, which is a plus. If only the ink blot hadn't set a bad tone for my opinions of the color. That aside, while us slower riders aren't going to be wowed by the dynamic range on this one, I would say that you faster riders that don't demand water resistance may be pleasantly surprised by the dynamics on Rhodia. Now let's move over to TR and see what we get. This too is a good departure from the ink blot and has that caramel chew feel to it. Good on you Kaveco, I knew you could do it. Anyways, I thought we were going to have another summer purple situation on our hands. By the way, go check out that video if you haven't already, you'll understand what I mean. Anyways, back to caramel and TR. We definitely get more dynamic range on this one. But if I had to pick which side of the blot this range comes from, I would definitely be left hand side. I don't think slow riders, especially with a broad nib, are going to see the tones light enough to be over on the lighter tan side. As far as performance is concerned though, Caramel is once again very well behaved. I'm not getting any hard starts, no skipping. The examples are actually very well done. My journal entries with this ink have all been a pleasure to write, and I really like the sepia feel that the ink kind of has in it as it dries. 
if I could have the performance on Tomoe with the dry time that I see on Rodia and the water performance of Rome Burning, then, well, yeah, this ink would be a perfect brown for me. As it is, though, I'm still going to be on the hunt for a perfect brown ink to add to my collection. And that's our look at Caramel Brown from Kaveco. If you like the video, hit that thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't, and become a patron if you want to contribute to the dog treat and coffee fund. Till next time, don't drink the ink.